Hi everybody, welcome to the Heath Lecture Series. This evening we have a stellar CEO, CEO Buzz.com companies who provide us with a wonderful opportunity to learn from his leadership and expertise, which is the driving force for the creation of the Heath Lecture Series. Um, to get us on track, I would like to ask uh, Associate Dean Murphy to say a few words. Hi everybody, thank you for coming tonight. This is a great opportunity to get together and hear from experts in the industry. I'm often asked when prospective students come to Stevens, you know, what makes Stevens different than the other schools that I'm considering? And there's a lot of ways that we're different, but I think one of the ways that we are different that is a lot of value to you is our location and our access to industry. You know, we're just more able than other schools in the middle of Pennsylvania to tap into experts like Mr. Thies to come in and talk to us about their career, their companies, you know, what's happening out there. And uh, this, this knowledge that we can gain is, is really invaluable. And I particularly am excited about this Heath Lecture Series that we've been doing. Um, and it's run by Svi Aronson, who was just speaking. Um, we, with this series, really highlight the best of our, our industry connections and, and what we have to learn from our, our sort of our industry context. So um, anyway, I wanted to welcome you all here today and uh, let you know that um, that we'll be having more events like this, so keep, keep an eye out for it. Um, uh, also, just a quick service announcement. There are sign-in sheets in the front of the room if you can see them already. And I would like you to turn off your phones or silence them if you haven't already. Um, of course, uh, give our speaker, yeah, I did the same thing. It's not true. Yeah, very good. Um, so, but I, I would like to do that, you know, give our, our, our best attention to our, to our speaker. But I'm not going to formally introduce our speaker, I'm going to instead turn over the mic to Professor Donald Lombardi, uh, a pal of our speaker actually, I just under, I understand, um, who's going to give you a little bit of his background and, and formally introduce him. So thank you very much. Well, good afternoon everybody. I was really hoping you were. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to get able with him. Great day, nice day in Castle Point. I have a very nice assignment today, which is to introduce our guest speaker, who truly does exemplify everything we look for in leadership, as well as financial management. The speaker today is a true Jersey boy. He was born in uh, Red Bank, grew up in Toms River, crowd graduate of Monsignor Donovan High School. Uh, he brings a wealth of knowledge to us today, over 30 plus years of experience uh, at all the named places, not only e as a CEO, uh, Jeffries and Company, Goldman Sachs and Citibanks, among others. It's also really, to me, we talk about leadership all the time. This man exemplifies it from a governance perspective as well. He's on the board of Regents at his alma mater, Georgetown University. He's on the board of uh, Heart 911, which is a tremendous nonprofit. And then I had the truly the privilege and blessing of working with him in his governance activity uh, with the Visiting Nursing Association Health Group here in Jersey which is the second largest home care group in the United States of America. And he had to actually jump in and be the CEO for about 11 months. And to me, a good executive exemplifies decency, and recognizes that the human touch is always your best product, fortitude, so when the going gets tough, the tough get going, industry, so he works both hard and smart, integrity, which is absolute and unconditional, and always bringing knowledge to the equation. And this gentleman exemplified in his time there as he does. And you'll see in a sec, he'll exemplify it in his comments today. He was a graduate of Georgetown University. He was, uh, got his AB there in international relations. He was a George F. Baker scholar. And I must mention this and personally attest, one of the greatest living legends in Hoya football history. So with that, folks, put your hands together. How about a fantastic Castle Point welcome for us. Thank you, Don, Ann, Zvi, and uh, everybody. Uh, is everything on, working? Dan, am I good? Um, obviously, there isn't such a thing as a Hoya football legend, um, unless you're talking about them after they went into their medical careers or their doctors' or lawyers' <laughs> careers. Uh, the football career thing was just a lot of fun, which hopefully you're all experiencing here at Stevens in terms of enjoying your academics, enjoying your camaraderie with your classmates, and enjoying 
uh, whatever it is that you enjoy. And I thought, first and foremost, I'll tell you a little bit more about me so you get a little bit of sense of what makes me tick. Um, I'm very excited to be here. I know we only have a half hour. I, I, I've talked, I, I, I met with somebody the other day. I said, this is meeting number 172 where I'm trying to accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish at bonds.com. And I think it's a mission and I think it's a cool mission. Not everybody agrees and some people actually disagree, but in the interest of time, I'll just give you my point of view, not necessarily the people that disagree. Um, I'm kidding. I will tell you both sides of the story. <laughs> so uh, Don did the introductions. I spent most of my career at Morgan Stanley, 17 years um, away from that, uh, a host of other things. I retired in 2006. I didn't call it retirement. What I called it is sabbatical. Um, so just to give you the history of my evolution in electronic trading, in the year 2000, uh, there were about 100 companies trying to do what Bonds.com is trying to do today. Most of those companies failed and went out of business. One of them was one that Morgan Stanley put $30 million into. It was called Bondbook. And we had partners that were trying to help us do it. Bondbook had $30 million from Morgan, Goldman, and Merrill Lynch. And in a mere two years, 75 of that $90 million was gone, and so was the company and the employees. Um, so what I'm about to talk to you about which really, if I get it and boil it down into one thing, it's called behavioral change and technological introduction and success is incredibly hard to do. But if you get it right, it's incredibly rewarding and also theoretically makes the place that you're trying to address a better place to do what it is you're trying to do. And that means whether it's Facebook, Google, Google Gmail if you use it, or, uh, or the equity market or the bond market. Technology has been a great enhancing tool for us uh, in, that, in that sequence. Um, oh, I wanted to tell you one other thing. The last band I saw, um, I'm, a, I'm a relatively big music person. I thought maybe you all uh, could, you all being the youthful crowd here, could relate. The last band I saw was last Thursday at Terminal 5. I don't know if anybody went to the Naked and Famous and the Colorist at Terminal 5, but that was the last band I saw. The band I saw most over the last 12 months is Passion Pit. And um, the band I've seen most in my life is Bruce Springsteen, the E Street Band. And that does, by a factor of hundreds, dwarf any of the other bands I've seen. So with that in mind, um, let's, let's start with a simple theme. I talked about technology. The world, and everybody talks about change, everybody talks about the evolution of change, the pace of change exponentially every seven years, everything doubles, triples, what have you, and we go into exponential change. You know, in 1950, the server was a $500,000 instrument. It stood in the size of this room, and the server today is, my phone's getting charged, but there's a server in there, and there's a server that bonds.com, actually we have 23 of them, they're located not far from here, and they service everything we do. Um, they cost about $35 you know, $100, uh, depending on maybe 50, 500 bucks. So the cost of doing what anybody wants to do technologically is radically changed. Uh, in visible sense, that has impacted the equity market in a tremendous way. And the equity market has completely changed. So you all uh, were born around the time when the New York Stock Exchange floor was filled with people that were doing the jobs that computers do today. And I mean that 100%. There are people that show up on the floor. There are newscasters that show up on the floor. There are things that go on on the floor. But there's nothing like what used to occur on the floor, which was the job of making markets and stocks. The exchanges do that now. Companies that didn't exist 10 years ago are dominant players in that. And they all did it through technology, client service, and ideas. The bond market, in contrast, is a much different place. And I mean it's we're in the primitive lands of evolution in the bond market on a relative basis. And so I give you this one demonstration as starting point, Exhibit A. In 1988, there was somebody I met outside by the name of RJ. Where's RJ, right? So I said, I'm using your initials in my first slide. It's actually my second slide. RJR buys Nabisco at the time for $26 billion. It was the largest LBO leverage buyout in the history. KKR buys the public holders. They leverage up the company. After 10 years, it was successful. It was expected to be successful in 24 months. Every projection they had was wrong. Everybody considered it a waste of enormous resources, job cutting, et cetera. But the end result was that the private equity did what it did. 
what I want to address is how did people trade bonds in 1988? They picked up a phone, and I don't know if any of you have ever actually seen a phone that looks like this, the youth in the group, but that's what the phone looked like, and it worked just like that, and you had to actually dial it. There, there were such things as direct lines, but you know that phone was the way that most of the bonds or loans traded in RGR in 1988. 25 years later, the second week, third week of September, 2013, Verizon makes a strategic move to finally make the decision, speaking of decisions, to buy out Vodafone and will ultimately own 100% of Verizon Wireless and collect that annuity. I'm sure in your finance class you're talking about whether that economic stream is worth it or not. Um, maybe not in this instance, but in some instances. But for the point of purposes here, $49 billion worth of bonds were priced. They were sold, they were placed with people like the state of New Jersey, state of New York pension funds, Wellington Management, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, PIMCO, BlackRock. These are more, some of the more famous investors, places in the world. Warren Buffett probably bought a bunch, or at least he hopes he did, because the day after, 49 billion was worth 53 billion. So the bonds were up 10% in a day. That's a good return on your money, especially since they settle three days later and you actually haven't paid for them yet. But what I want to emphasize is the number one vehicle for trading that bond in 2013, how Fidelity traded, how Goldman Sachs traded, how Morgan Stanley traded. And again, this is a professional market. Very few, if any, individuals. My, my suspicion is if Warren Buffett put an order in, he probably got them. But if you or I put an order in for new issue Verizon, we probably didn't get the order filled. But most of those bonds traded in a phone or like phone communication vehicle. And it's an amazing statement to the marketplace that I'm addressing with bonds.com and that other competitors are trying to address as well to realize that the opportunity that has been garnered, executed upon, and perhaps to a certain extent pendulum has fung, swung too far in the equity market is still there for people to succeed on in the bond market. And that's what I tell the 21 employees at bonds.com that are working towards trying to execute on that opportunity. It's an amazing thing that we're here in 2013, and Bloomberg doesn't own this space. They own everything else, they don't own this space. They've tried, they haven't succeeded to the degree that should be success. Bonds.com has not succeeded in any dramatic fashion on a relative basis. And Market Access and TradeWeb are the two prominent players in the space, yet in the credit markets today, only approximately 20% of the market trades in what anyone would consider to be an electronic fashion. And I hope, I hope the bond market in general doesn't bore you as a topic, and I understand music is a cool thing, but this is what I do for a living, and I've watched this happen since 1982 when I joined the marketplace in corporate debt credit. It's done nothing but grow. A lot of that has to do with growing jobs and investing in a very, very positive and meaningful economic event that occurs around the globe. Apple didn't just take the 17 billion to take 17 billion, but they didn't need the 17 billion. They had 140 billion in cash on their balance sheet. They took the 17 billion because they think at some point in the future, they're gonna do something better with it. And, they are, and, and, and starting with, they're gonna pay a dividend. And it was an economic way for them to do that. It was an economic decision in all respects because their interest is obviously tax deductible and their dividend rate was uh, higher than their uh, than their um, interest rate. So they're gonna retire dividend, they're gonna retire common stock with, with debt. And that's gonna make the cost of their money sitting on their balance sheet less. So we've had a, so we have a marketplace that we're addressing here that is nine trillion in outstandings. That's the outstandings of the marketplace. And then on a given day, how much, how much in, in the context of the bond market, how much of the market that's nine trillion in outstandings actually trades on any given day? On any given day, as you see in the secondary market, although you've had exponential growth in terms of the outstandings, which was this slide, in terms of the growth of trading, trading has been somewhat muted. Although growing, although positive, high yield, the red, and investment grade, the blue, are relatively speaking static and slower growth vehicles than, for instance, what's occurred in treasuries over the last 30 years. And obviously, treasuries have gone up significantly in terms of outstandings, alongside the fact that the government's debt has gone up dramatically 
But the turnover in the treasury market, the velocity of treasuries that trade every day, is a much higher percentage of outstandings relative to the uh, corporate bond marketplace. For purposes of us here, what I would like to suggest to you is that the marketplace in corporates is being held back from the opportunity to be more efficient because no one has succeeded at delivering the technology and the vehicle with that technology to allow clients to connect in a better way than the way they formerly and now currently still do, which is a phone or phone-like vehicle. What's occurred in the course of the last five years post the crisis is a significant, significant problem that only heightens the opportunity that the electronification of the market will provide to the successful entrant into the space. So we have on two, si two slides here, the value, which is a, is a similar value to, now the, the, the slide to your left is the bonds that are included in the index. That's a subset of that nine trillion. And what you have is a slide on the right that shows since 2008, the decline in capital committed to this business by the Wall Street dealers who have traditionally been the liquidity providers. So they would put up capital to provide Fidelity, Wellington, Loomis, and any other quote unquote buy side firm. When I use the word buy side and sell side, is that a familiar term to everybody? So the sell side means Wall Street. The buy side means state of New Jersey pension. It means Fidelity, it means PIMCO, it means BlackRock. The buy side buys bonds. They sometimes never sell them. The sell side is, is a warehouse. They take them in, they take them out. That's what Goldman Sachs does, that what's, that's what Morgan Stanley does, that's what Bank America does. They're in the clearinghouse business, in the, in the buy side is in the, uh, the storage business, let's call it that. So the inventory has declined, the inventory or the capital committed to the marketplace has declined by nearly 80%. I have another slide on that that perhaps heightens it and shows it more dramatically since 2002, courtesy of market access the largest player in the e-trading e space in the credit markets, if you'd ask me, they would, and, and FYI, in 2005 and 2006, I was the chief operating officer after I left Morgan Stanley of market access. While I was at Morgan Stanley, after I watched $30 million go down the drain, I knew that I wanted something to work, and I helped this company build this from Morgan Stanley. They liked me so much, they liked my help so much, they hired me for, for the next two years. And what, I, what I'm highlighting here is that we have an even more dramatic picture. So we have in this tailwind on the right, the Federal Reserve has stopped releasing data in aggregate and they've changed their data format to a breakdown of the products that they used to aggregate to show an even more dramatic reduction in capital to the business. With that more dramatic reduction in capital to the business, what we have is a problem. And we have alongside a problem an opportunity and I'd like to suggest what else is happening in the trends in the marketplace and then talk about what that opportunity is and what I'm going to try and do about it and what others are trying to do about it as well. So since the client base, the buy side, now has nine trillion of securities they're trying to trade and since the dealers, the sell side, has what they used to have is 250 million in capital to commit against that nine trillion, now they have approximately 30 billion, so nearly down 90 percent. The problem of this nine trillion, that it doesn't always need liquidity every day, but it wants to know that it could find it, has to find an efficient way for the ultimate home, the storage people, to get to that. The phone, the one, either one, the one where you dial or the one where you push the buttons, is not the solution or the answer to the game. The answer to the game is to find a better electronic vehicle that has a host of protocols that can allow the marketplace to have everybody show up in one, let's call it homogeneous universe and, and allow the end result of that to give clients and dealers both the choice to get to the market with an efficient tool that will allow everyone to know what they're trying to do and will allow everyone to know what they would like to do versus whatever anyone else is trying to do. The trends that have been information due to this problem are as follows. What's occurred is we've had smaller trades, given that the lack of volume, sorry, the lack of capital has been, been committed by the dealers. What the clients have done and what we've seen in the trends and the data over the last four years 
is the size of the average, the average size of trading has gone down, has been reduced. And I've just cut out a couple segments of growth to show you that. In the smaller than 100,000 lot trade, which we would call micro lots in the institutional market, you've got a growth in trade count of 131%. In the 100 to 1 million space, which is the odd lot space, you've got over 200% growth. And in the round lot or block space, you have almost a 50% reduction in the trade count in those spaces over the course of the last few years, since 2007. Another slide just to highlight this. Since 2007, the less than 1 million in aggregate size, not trade count, but now we're talking volume. In volume, you've got an increase in volume happening, 21% increase in the less than 1 million space, and the greater than 1 million space is down 32%. All this screams the word problem. It screamed the word problem to me so much that I, ran, uh, I left running Jeffrey's Fixed Income and joined Bonds.com in June of 2012. Um, if it, I'll say one other thing about the, uh, the problem citation. Um, if it were that easy to do, then somebody would have already done it. We'd already be where I'd like to think we're going to go. So it's not that easy. Why isn't it that easy? If everybody knows there's a problem and if everybody thinks that they should have a better way to do it, and everybody has been a witness to the equity market, electronifying every tick on the equity market is now an electronified tick. I made a point to a number of folks I met earlier. The world, in electron the, the world of electronification and equities has impacted everybody. It's impacted your mom and dad. It's impacted the, um, the pension funds that execute. It's impacted Wall Street. Wall Street has a, a cost structure that they've had to evolve because it's too costly to run the business the way you used to run it. Um, the way it used to be is you used to have to pay thousands of dollars to buy 100 shares of stock. And now you pay $7.95 at Schwab or E-Trade or Ameritrade or Fidelity to buy thousands of shares of stock. It's a wonderful trade for the individual and for corporations and for pensions. Your cost of transaction has gone down dramatically. The cost of transaction in the bond market has gone down, but not nearly as dramatically. And more importantly, alongside the cost of transaction is, has the efficiency of the process of trading bonds gotten better? And I would suggest and postulate that it has gotten slightly better over the course of 10 years. I mean, that phone, the one below versus the one above, it's obviously a better phone. I don't know how obvious it is, but it suggests that it's a better phone, except when it goes down and actually shuts off, because the other phone always, it never went down because it was a hard line into it. This phone had connections that actually does go down occasionally. So what I'd like to lay out here is to talk about the evolution of the competitive landscape and the opportunity. So you have the history, you have the market, nine trillion, you have the problem, which is the nine trillion in growth hasn't been commensurately complemented by the dealers committing more and more capital. Let's talk about why that is before we go into the, let's theoretical solution side. Um, give me a, give me, just let's, let's do it, not a test, let's just do a couple of Q and A here. Give me a law that's been passed in the last five years that you've heard about that has a regulatory impact on Wall Street. Dodd-Frank. Not Glass-Steagall, that was 1935. <laughs> that might be repealed, by the way. So you've got Dodd-Frank, you've got Basel III, you've got CEF regulations, whereas every derivative in the world has to go, OTC now is gonna have to go exchange like in its trading. Over the last three years, Wall Street has had an enormous amount, some more than others and some more visible than others, but every corner of Wall Street has an enormous amount of burden and regulatory nuance that has changed the way they have to do business. Alongside that, the capital commitments requirements of Basel III, which have already been implemented for the European banks like Deutsche Bank and Credit Suisse, which are coming ashore to the U.S. here Jan 1, 2014, have only caused the dealers to need to be more efficient. So this is not just because the US or the European or the global investment banks don't wanna make money, so therefore they're not committing capital. They don't have the capital to commit to the degrees that Dodd-Frank and other rules are requiring them to in the interest of the safety of the system, right? There's a purpose in that theoretically and hypothetically and hopefully actually. But the purpose is that we're trying to preserve the health of the banks. They weren't good enough to do it on their own, although some of them looked like they were in 2008. No one looks like it is right now. 
um, but the net net is where we've instituted rules so that people use capital and have more protection and so that the government doesn't have to bail them out again. So those rules have been enormous burdens and therefore in response to those rules, dealers have behaved radically differently. Uh, at Morgan Stanley in 2003, I had a $40 billion balance sheet in the credit business that I ran in New York at 1585 Broadway. 40 billion under me, there were about 100 people. There is not 40 billion in balance sheet on Wall Street in 21 primary dealers today. In the, and again, we're just talking about the credit market, one segment of the fixed income markets. And I, I should say at the top line, fixed income as a whole has grown from two and a half trillion in 1980 to 38 and a half trillion here this year. So we've had not only that zero to nine trillion in corporates, but we've had that growth across the rest of the spectrum. The rest of the spectrum being mortgages, agencies, treasuries, asset backs, emerging markets, et cetera. So what is a bond trader to do? What is a firm to do? What is a client to do? How is this going to get resolved? What works today? And how does the process work? And why is it even a problem? Well, it's a problem because alongside the growth in outstandings has been the growth in trading. And you want to have the right to redeem whatever you want to redeem on a given day because you want to pay for college or you want to pay for a house or you want to do whatever you want to do. And Fidelity wants to give you your money the minute you want it. So Fidelity just doesn't buy bonds. They sell bonds too. And they respond to their customer flows and they respond to what they think about the marketplace. And what they are trying to do is increase their velocity and their capacity to trade. So what has occurred technologically that's been really positive is there have been systems built to help them do that. Whether the system, and I say Fidelity, PIMCO, name anybody, Bloomberg, those systems have helped in the order management and the execution management side quite well, but they haven't really gone through to the trading side in any radical fashion relative, again, to the equity marketplace. So what works really well today is about 20% of the marketplace, about 20% of the marketplace, in, and again, we're just talking about the credit markets, which is the investment grade and the high yield corporate bond marketplace. Names like IBM, Google, Apple, Verizon. So that 20%, how does that trade? Um, and let's talk about protocols for a second. So bonds.com, what do we do? We do a central limit order book. What is a central limit order book? It's that screen I showed you. It's an anonymous all-to-all. -all. Any client can come in there, buy side. Any sell side client can come in there. They could trade, they can make a price, they could take a price. If you were to ask the SEC, they would say, that sounds like a really fair and open marketplace. That type of market exists at bonds.com. It doesn't exist almost anywhere else on the planet. And that's less than 1% of the corporate bond marketplace on a given day. I'd love to be here and repeat this with maybe more excitement when we're 10% of the market, but right now we're less than 1% of the marketplace, bonds.com. We only at the moment, this is again the vision, at the moment we only do undisclosed trading. We don't give choice. We'd love to do it, that's my vision for where the world has to go, but we're not there yet. Love to have the banks give me streaming prices on 500,000. By the way, inside their own firms, they're making them 25 million up on the Verizon 30 year. All I want to do is create a market that makes it efficient for 500,000 up with a stack of 10 bids and 10 offers so it makes it easier for any of those clients to tap into that liquidity and increase velocity. Over here, we have what I call RFQ Pro. Request for quote is what RFQ stands for. 16% of the market RFQ happens electronically. Most of that happens on a company system called Market Access. They are the leader in the space. They have a market cap of 2.4 billion. When I left them, my wife reminds me of this, by the way. When I left them, they had a market cap of approximately 300 million. Did I mention my wife reminds me of this? Just to be clear, they went from 300 million to 100 million after I left. So, uh, but that doesn't make me any, uh, any happier or not happy. I'm happy for the success that company's had. I had a lot to do with building it. It's been a tremendous success, and it's an amazing opportunity for everybody else to say, well, wait a minute, there's a company worth $2.5 in this space. How do we do what they do? Who's got that idea? Somebody's got to have that idea, right? There must be somebody else trying to do this. Of course there are. There are 10 people, 20 people, not 100 anymore, because a lot of them have spent so much money trying to do this, they've given up, but not me. So RFQ has the potential to grow more. 
But RFQ has its problems because RFQ, in a disclosed fashion, somebody called me and said, electronification has really increased. Market access had its best month ever in September of 2013. Electronic trading is growing. I said, I have to tell you, my view of this is electronic trading is not what market access does. Market access is a more efficient, a really efficient phone. Because what you do on market access is you hit a button, and out of that button comes 20, 40, 60 requests for quote. And they go electronically. And so instead of making 20 or 40 or 60 phone calls, are there 60 people who can make a bid or an offer on Verizon 30 years? Yeah, there are. So you try and tap into anybody that has the potential to be able to respond. You're a buy side client. You're saying, hey, it's me, Wellington, or hey, it's me, PIMCO. And you're saying to the trader at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, hey, you're in competition with everybody else, but I'd like to get your best quote on this bond, and then I'll let you know if I want to trade it. That's how it works. So it's a really efficient phone. So we're still in this migratory mode in a primitive mode of trading, but it works, and most especially, it works because it's easy, because it, you don't have to make 20 phone calls. In seconds or minutes or hours, depending on the time frame you'd like, you'll get your responses and you can request a quote and get a response and trade. And so to date, the only thing that happens also is it's client to dealer. There's no dealer to dealer, there's no dealer to client activity. There's a lot of opportunity for expansion and efficiency and potentially increased velocity in this space. One thing I highlight here, clients aren't used to trading with clients. They're not used to it. It's allowed over here. It's frowned upon by the street, but the street, Wall Street, given that they're not committing $250 billion in, biz, in, in capital anymore, has lessened its objection to clients being able to have connectivity to clients. All that I propose in my vision for the world is that the clients have to tell the street what they're doing if they're going to sell or they're going to buy. If you're going to tell somebody, you don't have to tell them even who you are. You get a choice to disclose. If you want, your choice is yours. But if you want to tell them, hey, it's me, Fidelity, you're only going to tell the sell side. You're not going to tell Prudential or MetLife or the state of New Jersey and vice versa. They're not going to tell you. So this is 16% of the market. My vision is there'll be more competitors in this space. My vision is somebody's going to succeed equally as much as the one that's the incumbent monopolistic leader. And if you're somebody who's paying them, obviously, if they're worth $2.5 billion, they must have some revenues, and they must have some profits, and they must charge people. And there's, this, is, this school has a word in it that I'd like to highlight. Stevens Institute of Technology. What does technology do? It disrupts. There's going to be a disruptor that comes in and enters the space I've got a book recommendation for you at the end. That disruptor is going to have a price disruption along with a technology disruption. It's going to be a lot of fun for them. It's going to be really hard for the leader. The incumbent's response to that's going to be interesting. There's going to be books written about it, and you're getting to know a little bit of a window on it. And I don't know if you're as excited as I am. If you had this much excitement, I don't know if you would have taken the job a year ago because we're still less than 1% a year later, so I'm not raging here with the success of the of the, op of the platform, but I am continuing to rage about the opportunity that's ahead of us. The rest of this is, if we get this right, and I say we, I do mean the industry, by the way. I'm not here as, I'm here as the executive CEO of Bonds.com, but I'm not talking about Bonds.com. I'm talking about the market, and I'm talking to you about what the opportunity is, and so to encapsulate and you know, crystallize it for you to see the whole picture of the credit markets and the challenge and the opportunity. The rest of this is the opportunity. If you've read the Wall Street Journal, which uh, not sure it's in your daily habit, you would have read a lot about the, the more recent innovations. The more recent innovations have been, for instance, Goldman's G Sessions is in the press every other week. Goldman Sachs created this auction process, my enhancement slide five, uh, section five. They created this auction process where everybody gets to put their, effectively, their prices into a dark pool. Nobody knows who's there. And if there's success, it trades. If there's no success, everybody goes home. Nobody's given up their positions. One of the concerns in the bond market is if you're a seller of 100 million Verizons, the last thing you want to do is tell anybody else you're a seller of 100 million Verizons because the last thing you're going to do once you've done that is watch all them go sell it in front of you because they can because there's, there's, it's not an exchange. It's an open, over-the-counter market. Not that they would want to do that or they do want to do that, but if they're long 100 million Verizons, Verizons and you're 
they hear that you're a seller of them, the chances are they might have a reaction to that. Market reacts. So there's an opportunity for what I'd like to call a dark pool, light pool auction process. It's gonna be something interesting. It's gonna be experimental. We're not gonna to get to the final stage of a real good product, probably for another two or three years. But in my vision for how the world's gonna work and the company is gonna really succeed at all this, they're gonna get that right. And it, by the way, it's not gonna be Goldman Sachs. They've already given up. Now they haven't given up because they had a bad idea. They gave up because this stuff can't work inside of Goldman Sachs, because then Morgan Stanley's gonna try and do it, then Credit Suisse is gonna try and do it, then Barclays is gonna try and do it. It works in the middle of the market, so everybody has fair and equal access and nobody has an advantage. That's part of the key of a market that works. That's why the New York Stock Exchange, who never takes a position in a stock, can clear stock all day long, because they're not on one side or the other. They're on the sides that work for the client and the dealers together. <clears throat> this other thing, the bulletin board goes back to the heritage of the marketplace. We just need it to work a lot more efficiently. Dealers are sitting there with 40 billion or 30 billion or 50 billion or 20 billion. They're not sitting there with 250 billion worth of inventory. They're in the moving business. They're not in the storage business. So they want to let you know what they have. They want to let you know, hey, I'm long IBMs and I am short apples. And I'm not really care about either one of these trades. All I did was I bought IBMs because somebody wanted to sell them and I, and I sold apples because somebody wanted to buy them. Now I'd like to reverse that. I'd like to go home flat tonight. That's an ideal outcome. In, in program trading, you want to go home flat every day in the equity market. In the bond market, you never go home flat because you're committing capital and you can't find the buyer at 445 before they walk out the door at five and you're short apple and you're long IBM. There are, there are incredible improvements and enhancements in technology, uh, if you saw how this was communicated over Bloomberg, over a message system, you would sit there, well, for instance, equity folks have done this. Equity folks who now run fixed income and equity shops at the buy side. Those folks have, they, they have looked at this and they've walked into the fixed income room and they've said, you, you, don't, you can't possibly trade this way, can you? Do, you don't do it this way, do you? This is how you get your information. And the answer is yes, this is what we do, this is how we do it. So my vision for how this is gonna work is somebody's gonna put all these pieces together. In the meantime, the RFQ works very well and there'll be other entrants. I just put up a, a competitor, competitor slide to suggest, just to give you a little bit of landscape for what we're dealing with. So I just want to mention a few companies so that you're aware of who's in the business. By the way, there was one consolidation in the business that just happened in the last 30 days. Right in the middle of the slide, Bond Desk and, and TradeWeb Retail. I mentioned TradeWeb before. They're the leader in the rate space. In the odd lot retail space, TradeWeb Retail and Bond Desk just merged. Actually, TradeWeb Retail bought Bond Desk. Private company, advertised price $200 million. That company most recently sold in 2006 for $330 million. So I don't know that the person who sold it thought it was that good of a trade. It was, a, it was an income stream company that was earning money, so maybe they didn't lose money. But when you buy an asset for $330 million and you sell it for $200 million, you probably don't feel as good as you would have if you had just bought something else instead. Um, on the back end of that, Bonds.com, TradeWeb, Market Access, Bloomberg, Muni Center, Knight Bond Point, which is over here in Jersey City, New York Stock Exchange bonds, which by the way, 1920, New York Stock Exchange traded more bonds than they did stock. 1913, New York Stock Exchange barely trades a bond on a given day. In fact, most of the bonds they trade on a given day in terms of trade count happen over bonds.com. And NASDAQ just bought eSpeed for a billion dollars. The dealers that have platforms that are Again, I put the word dormant next to Goldman and Morgan Stanley. Potential uh, UBS pins is working. And there's a couple new entrants into the marketplace that seem to be well-funded. I put them down below, just two of them. There's probably another 10, and there's probably another concept ideas out there. If I could conclude, the words I wrote down for conclusion are expectation and, expectations and aspirations. Uh, the aspiration is that somebody if it were my aspiration, I'd be saying that we, we get one of these pieces right, we get to the next piece, we get that right. The biggest piece to get right is RFQ because it's the one that's working the best right now. The club's gonna work, it's gonna be an adoption rate. 
The other items, sessions, trading, and bulletin board are going to work as well. They're going to be great enhancements. But it's taken 10 years to get to this point. It's amazing how slow the bond market is on a relative basis, but I don't think the acceleration is going to happen anytime soon because it takes technology and technology takes time. So it continues to be an amazing opportunity. Uh, that's my expectation. The aspiration is at the end of the day, you're going to have a market that works a lot better than the one we have today. You're going to have participants in the market that are going to look back and say, I can't believe that's how we traded bonds. Can you believe that? Now, because it doesn't look that different 2013 versus 1990, 1988, there are folks in the business like me who were here in 1988, and a lot of them are still doing the same job they had in 1988, and they're almost doing it the same way, and they're doing it with a salesperson here and a phone and a trader over there giving them the price, and they're relaying the price, and they're doing trades. And that's how the Verizon deal was priced to a large extent. So my expectation and my aspiration for the marketplace is I don't think we're in the, the third inning of a nine inning game. I think we're going to hit the tipping point. I think the technology is going to come into place. I think new entrants plus old entrants plus Silicon Valley, something's got to give and it's going to give in a big way and it's going to change and transform. And it's been telegraphed so everybody should be ready for it. And who's going to get that right is still up for grabs. That's the bond market perspective. So most of the change is in the equity market driven by regulatory changes. So who regulates the bond market? So FINRA and the SEC regulate the bond market. You can't mark a bond up more than 5%. You, there are certain rules, but the cash bond market doesn't trade on an exchange. It trades over the counter. So within those rules, since it's not an exchange instrument, uh, if I commit my capital and I make a price on a bond and I say the bond is part of 101, and Goldman Sachs says the bond is 102, 103. We could both sit there with those two prices and you could buy them there and sell them here or vice versa and we're free to make those prices. And, that, and, that, and, that, and hence opportunity in the bond market has been very lucrative over the last 20 years. Fixed income has been a big driver to the investment banks. Okay. Thank you. To wear warrior blue, but we have another color. Okay, good. Thanks. So, so we got a couple mugs. And we'll figure it out and ask maybe have time for maybe two, three, four questions. Stick around, stick around. Yeah. Yeah. Is this Steven's sweatshirt? Oh, beautiful. Everyone Thank you. Here. Is it extra large? Yes. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish it, it was, I wish it didn't need to be, but it does. Thank you very Great much. Job. Thank you. And we got two coffee. I see. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yep.